Coffee Break Collection 17, Health and Fitness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Excerpt from Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome Associated with Intravenous Drug Use, United States, 1988 by the Centers for Disease Control. In 1988, health departments of the 50 states and the District of Columbia reported 9,752 cases, and the U.S. territories reported 995 cases of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, in intravenous drug users, IVDUs, their sex partners, and children born to mothers who were IVDUs or sex partners of IVDUs. These IVDU-associated AIDS cases represented 33.3% of the 32,311 AIDS cases reported in 1988 and included 5,789 53.9% male heterosexual IVDUs, 1,742, 16.2% female IVDUs, 2,055, 19.1% male homosexual bisexual IVDUs, 227, 2.1% men whose heterosexual partners were IVDUs, 620, 5.8%, women whose heterosexual partners were IVDUs, 231, 2.1% children whose mothers were IVDUs, and 83, 0.8% children whose mothers were sex partners of IVDUs. The 847 persons who were heterosexual partners of IVDUs accounted for 55% of the total 1,541 cases associated with presumed heterosexual transmission of human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. 379, 54.6% of the 694 other such cases occurred in persons born in countries where heterosexual contact is the predominant mode of HIV transmission. The 314 children whose mothers were IVDUs or sex partners of IVDUs accounted for 70.2% of the 447 cases associated with perinatal HIV transmission reported in 1988. In 1988, 4.3 cases of IVDU-associated AIDS per 100,000 population were reported by the 50 states, District of Columbia and U.S. territories combined. Rates for IVDU-associated AIDS varied widely by area. Rates in Puerto Rico, New Jersey, New York, and the District of Columbia were 10 for 100,000 population. In 22 states, rates were 1 for 100,000 population. Rates were higher in the Northeast Census region than in other regions and 54.5% of IVDU-associated cases were reported in the Northeast, which represents 19.7% of the population of the United States and its territories. In 1988, IVDU-associated cases accounted for 50.7% of all AIDS cases reported for the Northeast, 23.5% for the South, 19.8% from the Midwest, and 15.8% from the West, excluding states and territories with less than 10 reported cases in 1988. Three states and one territory had more cases in heterosexual IVDUs 
than in homosexual bisexual men who were not IVDUs. The rate of IVDU-associated AIDS continues to be higher for blacks and Hispanics than for whites, except for the West, where rates for whites and Hispanics were similar. This difference of race ethnicity was observed for all regions of the country and was greatest in the Northwest. IVDU-associated AIDS cases represented 16.3% of all AIDS cases in whites, 52.7% in blacks, 55.5% in Hispanics, 6.3% in Asians, Pacific Islanders, and 29% in American Indians, Alaskan Natives. Although homosexual bisexual male IVDUs represented approximately one-fifth of all IVDU-associated cases, this proportion varied widely by region of the country. Male homosexual bisexual IVDUs constituted 7.7% of IVDU-associated cases in the Northeast, 26.3% in the Midwest, 29.1% in the South, and 56.8% in the West. Similarities between homosexual, bisexual male IVDUs and other men with AIDS varied by demographic and disease characteristics. End of excerpt from Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome Associated with Intravenous Drug Use United States, 1988, by the Centers for Disease Control. Coffee Break Collection 17, Health and Fitness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The Diet of Children by Amelia Young. During the early stage of life, all heating and stimulating food and drinks should be strictly forbidden. They tend more certainly to produce disease in the really excited system during childhood than perhaps at any other period of life. Vegetables should, in fact, constitute the principal diet of children, especially the farinaceous substances such as bread, rice, arrowroot, potatoes, etc., to these may be added milk, soft-boiled eggs, and a very moderate allowance of plain and simply cooked animal food. Children in general have very excellent appetites, and the sufficiency of nourishing food is absolutely necessary, not merely to renew the waste of their systems, but also to supply materials for their daily growth. Three or perhaps four light meals a day will be found a good allowance during childhood. At one of these, the dinner or midday meal, animal food may be allowed, in moderation. For the others, bread or potatoes and milk, various preparations of rice or rice and milk, plain bread pudding and custard, form a proper and wholesome diet. All salted and high-seasoned food should be forbidden. Some have objected to butter for children, although experience would appear to show that a very moderate allowance of fresh butter is by no means injurious. Of vegetables, potatoes, carrots, turnips, beets and cauliflowers will be found most wholesome. They should be well boiled, and the potatoes and turnips eaten without being mashed or mixed with butter or fat gravy. Children should never be indulged in pastry of any kind. They may, occasionally, take a little of the cooked fruit of a pie, but even this should be in moderation. The drink of children should be simply water, milk, wee, or very weak tea, milk and sugar. All stimulating and fermenting liquors are not only unnecessary, but positively injurious. By increasing to an improper extent the circulation of the blood, they induce fever, indigestion, inflammation or convulsions, to say nothing of the danger of their use during childhood, giving rise to habits of intemperance in afterlife. 
the periods of the meals should be strictly regulated and in such a manner that the intervals between them should not be so great as to permit the children to experience at any time a sensation of hunger supper should be taken an hour or two before bedtime children should get their breakfasts as soon as possible after they have arisen and have been properly combed and washed the stomach is then empty and the appetite keen if food be too long withheld the cravings become either too importunate or the appetite fails either of which would be injurious as little variety of food as possible should be set before children since every extraordinary article becomes a new incentive to appetite they should never be indulged with a second course if they sit down with an appetite they will satisfy it by eating of the first articles presented to them hence all the rest is superfluous and therefore injurious if the appetite be trifling the less they eat at a time the better as by taking but little the appetite will more certainly return at the next meal but should this instinct of nature for an observance of moderation be neglected or attempted to be overcome by variety repletion with all its evils will follow instead of a renewed and healthy appetite following as would have been the case had the instinct been obeyed it will be found diminished and most probably attended with headache fever oppression or even vomiting children should not be allowed to eat frequently of bread and butter bread and molasses cakes or fruit between meals for this will either destroy the regular appetite or induce them to eat too much in the first case the stomach will be interrupted in its regular routine of function consequently the appetite will become either irregular or capricious in the second case all the evils attendant upon an over distension of the stomach must follow they should not therefore be suffered to carry food in their pockets to eat between meals or during school hours as this produces the injurious habit of requiring food at improper times by which the digestion of the previous meal is interfered with a fresh quantity of food being forced upon the stomach before it has properly digested that which had been before received children are to be restrained from any violent exercise immediately after dinner if not kept in a state of perfect rest they should at least be prevented from engaging in any pastime which requires considerable bodily exertion they should also be early taught the importance of eating slowly and chewing their food well on this account alone the habit of resting after a meal is of importance as it prevents them from swallowing their food hastily in order that they may return more quickly to their play in regulating the diet of children care should be taken not to force any particular article upon them after it is found by a fair trial not to agree with their stomach the contrary practice is both cruel and injudicious cruel because the poor child is forced to swallow what is disagreeable to it and injudicious because it is liable to perpetuate a disgust which most probably would have subsided had not forcible attempt been made to overcome it at the same time however great care must be taken that permanent dislikes are not formed at this period of life against certain wholesome articles of food this is often a matter of very great difficulty a good deal of close observation and discernment being required in order to distinguish between a wayward prejudice and an actual disgust the former if indulged in too long may be converted into the latter while the latter may often by judicious and well-adapted means be entirely removed children should never be suffered to eat alone unless the proper quantity of food be meted out to them otherwise they will eat too much if a child demand more than is judged proper for it its importunities should always be resisted with firmness or it will certainly acquire habits of gluttony end of the diet of children by emilia young coffee break collection 17 health and fitness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by andrea k effect of thought on health and the body from as a man thinketh 
by James Allen. The body is the servant of the mind. It obeys the operations of the mind, whether they be deliberately chosen or automatically expressed. At the bidding of unlawful thoughts, the body sinks rapidly into disease and decay. At the command of glad and beautiful thoughts, it becomes clothed with youthfulness and beauty. Disease and health, like circumstances, are rooted in thought. Sickly thoughts will express themselves through a sickly body. Thoughts of fear have been known to kill a man as speedily as a bullet, and they are continually killing thousands of people just as surely, though less rapidly. The people who live in fear of disease are the people who get it. Anxiety quickly demoralizes the whole body and lays it open to the entrance of disease, while impure thoughts, even if not physically indulged, will soon shatter the nervous system. Strong, pure, and happy thoughts build up the body in vigor and grace. The body is a delicate and plastic instrument which responds readily to the thoughts by which it is impressed, and habits of thought will produce their own effects, good or bad, upon it. Men will continue to have impure and poisoned blood so long as they propagate unclean thoughts. Out of a clean heart comes a clean life and a clean body. Out of a defiled mind proceeds a defiled life and a corrupt body. Thought is the fount of action, life, and manifestation. Make the fountain pure, and all will be pure. Change of diet will not help a man who will not change his thoughts. When a man makes his thoughts pure, he no longer desires impure food. Clean thoughts make clean habits. The so-called saint who does not wash his body is not a saint. He who has strengthened and purified his thoughts does not need to consider the malevolent microbe. If you would protect your body, guard your mind. If you would renew your body, beautify your mind. Thoughts of malice, envy, disappointment, despondency rob the body of its health and grace. A sour face does not come by chance. It is made by sour thoughts. Wrinkles that mar are drawn by folly, passion, pride. I know a woman of 96 who has the bright, innocent face of a girl. I know a man well under middle age whose face is drawn into inharmonious contours. The one is the result of a sweet and sunny disposition. The other is the outcome of passion and discontent. As you cannot have a sweet and wholesome abode unless you admit the air and sunshine freely into your rooms, so a strong body and a bright, happy, or serene countenance can only result from the free admittance into the mind of thoughts of joy and goodwill and serenity. On the faces of the aged there are wrinkles made by sympathy, others by strong and pure thought, and others are carved by passion. Who cannot distinguish them? With those who have lived righteously, age is calm, peaceful, and softly mellowed, like the setting sun. I have recently seen a philosopher on his deathbed. He was not old except in years. He died as sweetly and peacefully as he had lived. There is no physician like cheerful thought for dissipating the ills of the body. There is no comforter to compare with good will for dispersing the shadows of grief and sorrow. To live continually in thoughts of ill will, cynicism, suspicion, and envy is to be confined in a self-made prison hole. But to think well of all, to be cheerful with all, to patiently learn to find the good in all, such unselfish thoughts are the very portals of heaven, and to dwell day by day in thoughts of peace toward every creature will bring abounding peace to their possessor. End of Effect of Thought on Health and the Body From As a Man Thinketh by James Allen Recording by Andrea Kay
Coffee Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Female Education Physical Training by Rev. S. W. Fisher I have presupposed three things in reference to education. The field which it covers is also threefold, the body, the intellect, and the heart. The body is the living temple of the soul. It is more than a casket for the preservation of the jewel. It is more than the setting of the diamond. It is more even than an exquisitely constructed dwelling wherein the soul lives and works and worships. It is a living, sensitive agent into which the spirit pours its own life, through which it communes with all external nature, and receives the effluxes of God streaming from a material creation. It is the admirable organ through which the man sends forth his influence either to bless and vivify, or to curse and wither. By it, the immortal mind converts deserts into gardens, creates the forms of art, sways senates and shreds its plastic presence over social life the senses are the finely wrought gates through which knowledge enters the sublime dome of thought while the eye the tongue the hand are the instruments of the spirit's power over the outer world the soul incarnate in such a body enjoys a living medium of reciprocal communication between itself and all things without meanwhile the body itself does not arrive here mature in its powers nor does it spring suddenly from the imbecility of the infant to the strength of the man by slow development by a gradual growth in analogy with that of a tree whose life is protracted it rises after years of existence to its appointed stature advancing thus slowly it affords ample time for its full and free development in this physical training there are two points of special importance the first is the removal of all unnatural restraints and the pressure of unhealthy customs the second is the opportunity the motive and the habit of free exercise in the pure air of heaven these as causes of health and fine physical development are interwoven as are their opposites in the progress of society from barbarism to refinement it has often been the case that men, in departing from what was savage, have lost that which was natural, and in their ascent from the rude have left behind that which was essential to the highest civilization. In escaping from the nakedness of the barbarian, they have sometimes carried dress to an extreme of art which renders it untrue to nature and productive of manifold evils. In ascending from the simple and rude gastronomy of the savage, they have brought the art of cookery to such an excess of luxury as to enervate society by merely factitious appetites. In the formation of habits of life, social intercourse and amusements adapted to a refined state, they have introduced many things at war with a healthful development of both body and mind. The manly exercises of swimming, skating, riding, hunting, ball-playing, the bracing walk in storm and sunshine, the free ramble over hill and dale, all adapted to develop an independent, self-relying character, with the occasional reunion where wit, science, healthful industry and serene piety shed their benedictions, associating that which is free and bold with the refined and sacred, all these are, in many cases, displaced by frivolous and less healthful excitements. Our girls and boys, prematurely exalted into young gentlemen and ladies, are tutored by dancing masters, their manners disciplined into an artificial stiffness, and the free developments of an open nature formed under the genial influence of truly polite parents, the finest discipline in the world, arrested by the strictures of a purely conventional regimen, in which the laws of health and the higher spiritual life seem never to have been consulted with such a physical training associated with a corresponding education of the mind and heart they are ripe for the customs and fashions of life in harmony therewith 
and totally averse to the purer manlier and nobler duties and pleasures of a better state of society to dress and exhibit themselves to crowd the saloon of every foreign trifler who under the abused name of art and for the sake of gold seeks to minister to us those meretricious excitements which associate themselves with declining states and artificial forms of life to waste the most precious hours of night set apart by the god of nature for repose in dancing eating drinking and revelry follow naturally enough upon such training then in the rear come disease of body and mind broken constitutions and broken hearts and last of all with grim majesty death prematurely summoned avenges this violation of the laws of nature upon the miserable victims and quenches the glare of this brilliant day in the darkness of the tomb how utterly different is such training and such modes of life consequent upon it from those which are dictated by a thorough understanding of our nature and the great purposes of our existence for in all these things we shall find there exists a connection sufficiently obvious between the right education of the spirit and the body and that so strong is their mutual influence as to render it of great importance to care for them both in harmony with each other then shall we regard the perfection of the form and the vigour of our bodily powers casting away whatever did not consist with the health and finer developments of the physical system we should pursue that course of education which best prepared the body for its grand work as the living agent of the spirit in considering physical training it is allowable for us to look both at beauty and intellectual power a noble form in man a fine beautiful healthful form in woman are desirable for their outward influence created susceptible of deep impressions from external appearances it is neither religion nor good sense to undervalue them that men generally have overestimated their worth is a reason why we should reduce them to their true position and not sink them below it the palace of the soul should befit its possessor and as god has taken pleasure in scattering images of beauty all over the earth and made us susceptible of pleasure therefrom it is right that in the education of our children we should seek for the unfolding of the noblest and most beautiful forms shall we beautify our dwellings adorn our grounds with plants flowers and trees of various excellence improve the breed of our cattle and yet care not for the constituents and forms of those who are on earth the masterpieces of divine wisdom and possessors of all this goodly heritage most of all however as the agent of the spirit should we seek to rear our children in all healthful customs and invigorating pursuits it is possible indeed that a mind of gigantic powers may sometimes dwell in a feeble frame swayed to and fro by every breath of air but we are sure that such a physical state is the source of manifold vexations pains and loss of power it is a state which the possessor never covets which oppresses him with the consciousness of an energy he is forbidden to put forth and a force for moving the world crippled by the impediment of a frail body for the full discharge of all the duties of life for the affording of our mental powers a fair field for their action and especially for the education and advancement of succeeding generations it is indispensable the vigour of the body should correspond to the vigour of the intellect so far as to constitute the one the most efficient agent of the other it has rarely been taken into view that aside from the personal benefits of health in the greater power of present action the intense intellects and feeble frames of one generation are a ruinous draught upon both the physical and mental powers of that which succeeds a race of overwrought brains in enfeebled bodies must be recruited from a more healthful stock or their posterity will in time decline into idiocy or cease from the earth the process of degeneracy by an infallible law will pass from the body to the intellect and the descendant of a luther or a bacon go down to the level of the most stupid boor that drives his oxen over the sands of southern africa 
End of Female Education Physical Training Coffee Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon The General Art of Judo Learn it and tumble and fight to your heart's content by Anonymous from the New York Times, April 6, 1905 To judge by the exhibition of judo, which is the 33rd degree of jiu-jitsu, given by Professor Tsunajiro Tomita at the gymnasium at 1947 Broadway yesterday afternoon, there are no terrors attached to meeting a big man with a club at three in the morning, and nothing to be afraid of in tumbling out of a window or getting mixed up in an automobile smash. All you have to do with the big man with the club at 3 a.m. is to treat him to the judo clutch. Professor Tamita gave the exhibition yesterday for the benefit of the press. He said in a preliminary address that an erroneous impression existed in this country as to jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu, he said, is an almost extinct art and a savage one that were better extinct. The real art of self-defense is judo. Judo means gentle art. But although an exhibition of it is like the tackling of a mad bull in a china shop, the professor says that it is really all that its name implies. Jiu-jitsu, said the professor, was developed 350 years ago at a time when there was tribal warfare in Japan. Then a man with a long sword and a man with no sword would meet in the streets, and out of their undying hatred for one another, tribally speaking, it became necessary for the man with no sword to learn a few tricks for dislocating the joints of his enemy, choking him, and rendering him unconscious, etc. The professor said that the first lesson to be learned in judo was how to fall soft. He illustrated this by twirling one of his assistants in the air and throwing him on the mat with a crash. It is nothing, said Professor Tomita. It seems very terrible, but he feels nothing, for he falls with all his limbs and muscles in position. In order to convince the reporters, that there was really no danger of a judo expert hurting himself by a fall, one of the professor's assistants related a story of his grandfather who taught jiu-jitsu and judo. The grandfather fell from a piazza on the second story of a Japanese house and landed on a pile of rocks. The grandfather was only annoyed because he had soiled his kimono. The reporters were curious to know what Professor Tomita would do if an uppercut came along or a fist aspiring to the solar plexus. The professor said he hated to show the reporters, but calling one of his assistants, he asked him to deliver an uppercut, also to imitate that big man with the club at 3 a.m. The result was the same in both cases. A sibilant hiss, a whirl of solid bodies, a thud, then a polite, pardon me, in Japanese. End of The Gentle Art of Judo. Learn it and tumble and fight to your heart's content. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Coffee Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Le Croquette From Mr. Punch's Book of Sports Edited by J. A. Hammerton Le Croquette How He Will Be Played Shortly Offices of the Athletic Congress, Paris Cricket. Monsieur, I am overwhelmed with my gratitude to you and to the generous dignitaries, the chancellors of your universities, the heads of your great public seminaries, and the principal of your renowned Mary Le Bon College Club, for the information they have given me concerning Le Cricket, your unique national game, and I thank you in the name of my committee, for your present of implements, les wickets, les boules de canon, les grosses bois, the batsmen's weapons, les curas pour les ambes de long stop, and other necessaries for the dangers of the contest that you have so kindly forwarded for our inspection. But most of all, we are indebted to you for sending over a home team of your brave professionals to play the match against our Parisian. Holmes. 
for you rightly conjectured that by our experience of the formidable game in action, we should be able to judge of its risks and dangers, and after mature investigation, be able so to revise and ameliorate the manner of its playing, as to bring it into harmony with the taste and feeling of the athletic ambition of the rising generation of our young France. A match has taken place, as you will see by Le Score subjoined, which I enclose for your inspection. It was not without its fruits. It disclosed to us, as you will remark by referring to Le Score, very practically the dangerous, and I must add, the murderous capabilities that Le Criquet manifestly possesses. Our revising committee has already the matter in hand, and when their report is fully drawn up, I shall have much satisfaction in forwarding it to you. Meantime, I must say that the substitution of a light, large ball of silk, or some other soft material, for the deadly boule de canon, as used by your countrymen, has been decided upon as absolutely necessary to deprive the game of barbarism and harmonise it with the instincts which modern and republican France associates with the pursuit of a armless pastime. Les wickets, as being too small for the bowlsmen to reach them, should be raised to six feet high, and the umpire, a grave anomaly in a game cherished by a liberty-loving people, should be instantly suppressed. The over, too, should consist of sixteen balls. But these and many other matters are under the consideration of the committee. I now subjoin les score, I mean shown. A brief perusal of it will show you what excellent grounds the committee have for making the humanizing alteration at which I have hinted. All France versus an English home team. All France. Monsieur de Boisy, struck with murderous force on the front of his forehead by the boule de canon, and obliged to retire. B. Jones Johnson. Zero. Monsieur Naudin, heat on his fingers, which are pinched blue with the boule de canon and incapacitated. B. Jones Johnson. Zero. Le Marquis de Carousel. Receives a blow from the boule de canon on the front bone of his leg, and is compelled to relinquish the contest. B. Jean Chanson. Zero. B. Bousson. Receives a severe contusion of the cheek bone from the boule de canon, which is delivered with murderous intent by a swift round and bowlsman. B. Jean Chanson. Zero. Le General Grex. Heats his three wickets into the air in a daring attempt to stop the boule de canon with his batsman's club. B. Jean Chanson. Zero. Le Duc de Sepfazes has his pince nez shattered to atoms by the boule de canon and, being unable to see, withdraws from the innings. B. Jean Chanson. Zero. Monsieur Carillon. Monsieur le docteur Giroflet, le professeur d'équitation, all the three being given in turn out, legs in front of the wicket, leave the ground to arrange a duel with the umpire. B. Jean Jarson, zero. Monsieur de Montmorency, on reaching the wicket and seeing the terrible approach of the boule de canon, has a shivering feet which obliges him to sit down. B. Jean Johnson. Zero. Monsieur Jolibois, coming in last, triumphantly avoids the over, and is in consequence not out. The English home team. Jean Johnson, not out. 3,276. Brown Smith. Not out. 3,055. So the game stood at the end of the fifth day, when, spite all the efforts of all France, even the putting on of three bowlsmen at once, 
it was found impossible to take even one of the home team wickets. Yet the contest was maintained by the outside, with a wonderful heroism and elan. For though by degrees, and nobly attempting to stop the flight of the boule de canon, as each sped on each murderous course, driven by the furious and savage blows of the batsmen in all directions over the field, the fieldsmen, one by one, struck in the arms, legs, head, and back, began to grow feeble under their unceasing blows and contusions, steel one and all from the long leg off to the indomitable long stop faced the dangers of their situation with a proud smile indicative of the noble calm of an admirable spirit so monsieur the game which was not finished and which in consequence the umpire with a chivalrous generosity announced as drawn came to its conclusion you will understand from the perusal of the above the direction in which my committee will be likely to modify the rules of the game and simplify the apparatus for playing it so as to give your cricket a chance of finding itself permanently acclimatized in this country except monsieur the assurance of my most distinguished consideration the secretary of the paris athletic congress end of lake cricket Recording by Philip Gould. Copy Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mayo's Anesthetic by Joseph R. Buchanan. The suspension of pain under dangerous surgical operations is the greatest triumph of therapeutic science in the present century. It came first by mesmeric hypnotism, which was applicable only to a few, and was restricted by the jealous hostility of the old medical profession. Then came the nitrous oxide, introduced by Dr. Wells of Hartford, and promptly discountenanced by the enlightened medical profession of Boston, and set aside for the next candidate, ether discovered in the united states also but far inferior to the nitrous oxide as a safe and pleasant agent this was largely superseded by chloroform discovered much earlier by liebig and others but introduced as an anaesthetic in eighteen forty seven by professor simpson this proved to be the most powerful and dangerous of all thus the whole policy of the medical profession was to discharge the safe and encourage the more dangerous agents the magnetic sleep the most perfect of all anaesthetic agents was expelled from the realm of college authority ether was substituted for nitrous oxide and chloroform preferred to ether until frequent deaths gave warning nitrous oxide much the safest of the three has not been the favorite but has held its ground especially with dentists but even nitrous oxide is not perfect it is not equal to the magnetic sleep when the latter is practicable but fortunately it is applicable to all to perfect the nitrous oxide making it universally safe and pleasant dr u k mayo of boston has combined it with certain harmless vegetable nervines which appear to control the fatal tendency which belongs to all anaesthetics when carried too far the success of dr mayo in perfecting our best anaesthetic is amply attested by those who have used it dr thorndyke than whom boston had no better surgeon pronounced it the safest the world has yet seen it has been administered to children and to patients in extreme debility doctors frizzell and williams say they have given it repeatedly in heart disease severe lung diseases bright's disease etc where the patients were so feeble as to require assistance in walking many of them under medical treatment and the results have been all that we could ask no irritation suffocation nor depression 
we heartily commend it to all as the anaesthetic of the age dr morrill of boston administered mayo's anaesthetic to his wife with delightful results when her lungs were so badly disorganized that the administration of ether or gas would be entirely unsafe the reputation of this anaesthetic is now well established in fact it is not only safe and harmless but has great medical virtue for daily use in many diseases and is coming into use for such purposes in a paper before the georgia state dental society dr e parsons testified strongly to its superiority the nitrous oxide says dr p causes the patient when fully under its influence to have very like the appearance of a corpse but under this new anaesthetic the patient appears like one in a natural sleep the language of the press generally has been highly commendatory and if dr mayo had occupied so conspicuous a rank as professor simpson of edinburgh his new anaesthetic would have been adopted at once in every college of america and europe mayo's vegetable anaesthetic a perfectly safe and pleasant substitute for chloroform ether nitrous oxide gas and all other anaesthetics discovered by dr u k mayo april eighteen eighty three and since administered by him and others in over three hundred thousand cases successfully the youngest child the most sensitive lady and those having heart disease and lung complaint inhale this vapour with impunity it stimulates the circulation of the blood and builds up the tissues endorsed by the highest authority in the professions recommended in midwifery and all cases of nervous prostration physicians surgeons dentists and private families supplied with this vapour liquefied in cylinders of various capacities it should be administered the same as nitrous oxide but it does not produce headache and nausea as that sometimes does for further information pamphlets testimonials etc apply to dr u k mayo dentist three hundred and seventy eight tremont street boston massachusetts end of mayo's anaesthetic coffee break collection seventeen health and fitness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. On Walks and Walking Tours by Arnold Haltane Chapter 6 English Byways Section 6 My next walks were in England. For their size the British Isles probably afford the most varied tramping ground of any country in the world. Within a few hundred miles of radius you get infinite variety. The rolling downs, the quiet weld, hilly Derbyshire, mountainous Wales, Devonshire's lanes, the Westmoreland or the Cumberland lakes, these for the seeker of quiet. For the more enterprising there is a wild and broken scenery of the Northern Isles, and the lover of the homeless sea can choose any shore to his liking. Section 7. There is an impression abroad that in England you must confine your steps to the high road. That has not been my experience. True, you must not expect everywhere to be allowed to stalk anywhere across country, unless you were following the beagles. But so numerous are the byways and bridle paths, so easy has access been made through centuries of hereditary ownership, from one field or stile or farm to another. So generous, too, are so many landlords, that one can travel for many and many a mile without doing more than cross and recross the road. But true it is also that in order to do this, you must know something of the locality. One much hidden entrance to a most sequestered spot I hope I do no wrong in revealing here. London stretches out northwest almost to Uxbridge, nearly twenty miles out. That is, habitations line almost every inch of the way. After Uxbridge the road is hard, dry, and comparatively uninteresting. But near a crossroad, where is a house on either side, if you look carefully to the right, you will dimly discern beneath the shade of low bending boughs, and almost hidden by these, a simple unpretending style. I recommend you to climb over it, 
for it is the entrance to a great, quiet, secluded spot, several acres in extent, thickly wooded with superb beeches and firs, so thickly wooded that the sky is invisible, and the earth wholly in shade. But for the extreme kempness of the underbrush, and the fact that you have just stepped out of the London road, you might be in a primeval forest of the west. Nor is this the sum of its beauty. High though it is above the surrounding country, embosomed in this forest is a lovely lake, exquisite in its coloring, reflecting as it does the cloud-flecked sky, and all round its rim the bending boughs of the beach. Typical of England are this lake and park. They are private property, of course, but the owner gives every wayfarer leave of access. Typical of England, tenacious of rights, yet just, nay, generous to all. Chapter 7 A Spring Morning in England Section 8 He who knows not England I will here permit to peep into a page of a diary giving a glimpse of a morning dawdle on the Sussex Downs. Royal Oak Inn, Village of Poynings, 27th March, 1800-something, 11.30 a.m. The little maid is laying the other half of the table to supply me with eggs and bacon. I got me out of Brighton early, walked through Hassocks and Hurst Pierpont, and strolled on in any direction that invited, for I had the whole lovely day to myself, choosing chiefly byways and sequestered paths approached by stiles. The day was superb. The sky after a rainy night was a rich deep blue and across it sailed great white-gray clouds, the shadows of which chased each other, albeit solemnly and with dignity, over field and meadow. The fields sown with corn already tall were burnished green. They shone in the sunlight, the meadows were deeper in color. The slopes of the downs changed their hues every moment, every acre changed according as it caught the light direct, or through a thin cloud or was immersed in shade by a big and thick one. The ditches and the little banks by the road out of which the trim hedgerows sprang were green with a hundred little plants and weeds. The dock, the nettle, groundsel, stickabobs, ivy of every hue and shape, mullein, the alder well in leaf, and the hawthorn here and there in flower. Breakfast over. The most delicious bacon, the freshest of eggs, milk that might have masqueraded as cream, and all served with the extremity of respectful civility a fire smouldering in the hearth, a terrier longing to make friends. Otherwise, they shut the door and leave me to quiet privacy. The greenness of the hedges was exquisite, and here and there the primroses in profusion, and the violets, and birds. England teems with life. I heard the thrush. It is spring. It is spring. Oh, the joy. I tell you, it is, is, is and the blackbird screaming out of a bush, pretending to be frightened but only looking for an excuse to shout. The ring-doves really disturbed and rising with noisy wings. The rooks lost in real wonderment that anyone should stop and look at them for five minutes and cawing and cawing in vociferous interrogation. Querulous tits, chirping hedge-sparrows, cheeping linnets and finches by the hundreds and hundreds. A mere peep, but a peep photographed on the spot, and giving but a poor glimpse of a scene, the exact like of which you will not get elsewhere, the wide world over. And by the way, shouldst ever find thyself at this selfsame village of Poynings, omit not to examine the early perpendicular church. The alms box is an ancient thurible. Chapter 8 Autumn Reveries Section 9 This was in the spring. Autumn in England is equally lovely. In the New World, at least in the northern regions, there is a chill in the fall of the year. The cold northwestern winds cradled amidst paleocrystic ice, and blowing over tundra and prairie are untempered by gulf stream or ocean. Untempered, too, by cloud and moisture, they cut keen and reveal the leafless landscape in all its bareness. And it may be that they bring with them the thought that for many months to come that landscape will be bare indeed unless covered with a shroud of snow. Far different is autumn in England. I write this time situate in the basin of the Thames, and for many weeks I have been watching summer slowly give up its glowing glories, in order that other glories, not less wonderful in color, may take their place. 
for England is never colourless, nay, in England all through the year the colours are warm and sweet and comforting. The very trunks and twigs of the trees are warm with browns and greens and purples, the result of the mosses and lichens, minute epiphytic and parasitic vegetation, which the humid climate so greatly fosters. Even brick walls, the stepping stones in brooks, wooden palings, everything constructed by man, nature soon mellows with a gentle hand so that in place of stark and staring edifices where the bare boards or the dull paint form blotches on the scene, you have everywhere a great harmony of color, violets shading into green, greens gliding into softest yellows, and these again deepening into warm and beautiful orange and gold and red. A long, long tramp through beachy Buckinghamshire one day revealed at every step beauties that filled the eye and filled the heart. No pen could do them justice and among painters only the brush of a corret could attempt their depiction without depriving them of their exquisite, their almost evanescent softness. A great mist lay over the land, a gentle, noiseless mist that hid from you the horizon and the outer world, that shut you in from the outer world, lured you into that mood of quiet reverence in the presence of quiet, wonder-working nature, and revealed to you, I cannot tell all that was revealed, I can only point to this and that beautiful little thing or vision, themselves but emblems of a beauty and a mystery invisible. Again I saw the little ivies in the ditches, again I saw unnumbered little leaves and stalks and tendrils in the hedges, all of shape and texture and color actually and positively divine. The hedges, a tangle of twigs thick with a hundred growths, were mighty marvels that no human clipping and pruning and trimming could diminish and at every few paces rose out of these hedges on either hand old majestic elms, great in girth, tall of stature, interlacing their branches high overhead and making for pygmy, me, who walked that winding lane. A wondrous fane in which to worship. It was not exactly what one saw with one's bodily eye that roused worship in that fane. What was it? As morning grew towards noon and the sun gained power, that gentle mist, so noiseless like an angel's hand laid soothingly on me and on all that hemmed me in, the mist mysteriously withdrew itself, but only to show fresh loveliness. On either hand were meadows, still lush with grass, or brown and furrowed fields shot through with the myriad tips of growing corn, and here and there in scattered heaps lay the rich leaves of the oak and the elm and the beech brilliant in their orange and russet, and here and there lit up like burnished gold by glints of sunshine between the clouds. For miles quiet little scenes like this filled the eye and the heart, entrancing, exalting, humbling. Wherein lay the secret of their appeal? Why is it that field and hedgerow, winding lane and interlacing boughs, strike upon the emotions of man? End of On Walks and Walking Tours by Arnold Haltane Recording by Philip Gould Coffee Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Overfeeding or Abstemiousness by Forbes Winslow 1810 to 1874 from on the preservation of the health of body and mind published in 1842 excerpt that more diseases arise from overfeeding among the wealthy than from the opposite cause excessive abstemiousness there can be no doubt fast and fear not you need no drop or pill hunger may starve excess is sure to kill it was an observation of dr hunter that most people live above par and this circumstance rendered the generality of disease and accidents more difficult to cure a celebrated physician inquiring of a person who was remarkable for the health which he enjoyed at an advanced period of his life what regimen he followed was answered i make but one meal a day keep your secret said the doctor if you publish it to the world you will utterly ruin the practice of medicine baron maceres who lived to the age of ninety and who never stood in need of medical advice 
went one day in every week without dinner eating only a round of dry toast at tea dr franklin is said to have lived upon bread and water for a fortnight and got stout and healthy on the diet dr gower of clemsford had a patient who lived for ten years on a pint of tea daily now and then chewing half a dozen almonds but not swallowing them dr wood was told by a physician that he knew a gentleman who never tasted fish flesh or fowl but who lived upon bread and milk he was once travelling and being very hungry he was induced to eat a small piece of chicken and the consequence was he immediately fainted away the younger daughter of frederick king of naples never could eat animal food if she did so violent and long-continued syncope succeeded the late duke of portland broke a blood vessel and by the advice of dr warren his physician he entirely changed his system of diet he lived for six weeks on bread and water during the whole of his subsequent life he entirely abstained from wine and malt liquor and ate very moderately the monks of monte santo never taste animal food they subsist on vegetables olives and cheese dr hickwatt of paris who lived to a very advanced age touched neither meat nor wine for thirty years it is stated by hazelquist in his travels in the levant that above a thousand Assinians who were destitute of provisions on a journey to cairo lived for two months on gum arabic and arrived at cairo without any unusual sickness or mortality End of overfeeding or astemiousness by forbes winslow coffee break collection seventeen health and fitness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by devora allen advertisement for strongfortism printed in electrical experimenter march nineteen nineteen can you honestly ask any girl to marry you can you marry any girl without making her the victim of the meanest kind of deceit a man is capable of are you fit to be a husband fit to make the girl you love the mother of children who will inherit your traits of body and mind think and think hard before you ask her to give her body and soul into your keeping unless you are fit you know what the law of heredity is there's no beating it what you are when you become a father your children are bound to be make yourself fit to be a father if you are skinny undeveloped weak watery blooded build yourself up before you marry so your children will not be rickety imitations of yourself if you are dyspeptic, bilious, constipated, or the victim of any other chronic ailment, such as youthful errors, vital losses, and consequential impotency, get rid of these handicaps. Don't take the risk of passing them on, in an exaggerated form, to the helpless little children you will bring into the world. You can't commit a worse crime than to make a sweet, pure, trusting girl the mother of weak, ailing, defective children, who will be a sorrow to her and a reproach to you as long as you both live. Have healthy, happy children. You can do it. You can make yourself healthy, strong, vigorous, full of life and the joy of living, and capable of transmitting that health and strength and happiness to children who will be full of rollicking fun, a comfort and a blessing to you and to the girl you marry. No matter how low down you have got in the human scale, and no matter how you got there, you can come back if you go about it the right way. I don't care how much druggist's dope or patent piffle you may have tried without success. Three hundred years ago the greatest brain in England wrote, Throw physic to the dogs. And Shakespeare knew, as every doctor knows today, that physic isn't the kind of food that makes men strong and vital, that fills them full of overflowing life and energy and spirit. Get strong in nature's way. Give old Mother Nature a chance to cure your ailments and build you up by living in the way she meant you to live, and you'll be amazed in a few weeks' time at the improvement in yourself. There's no guesswork about it. 
There's no doubt about what she can do for you, and there isn't any other way. Nature's way is the only way many men on the ragged edge of being thrown into the everlasting scrap heap of humanity can ever get back the health and strength and vigor and vitality of a man. I know. I've tried it, not only on myself, and I am called the strongest man in the world today, but also on thousands of miserably ailing, weak, downcast, discouraged men, suffering from early indiscretions, vital losses, and other troubles that are the result of these ailments who found their first ray of hope and comfort and quick improvement in the system of strongfortism that I teach. I will help you, as I have helped them, and as I am helping other men in every quarter of the civilized world today. I will show you how to shuffle off your ailments, how to develop your muscles, reinvigorate your vital organs, steady your nerves, clear your brain, how to become in a short time a 100% man and take the place in the world you ought to hold. Send for my free book. I have put the results of my life study, research, and experimentation on the subject of man's vitality and vigor into a book called Promotion and Conservation of Health, Strength, and Mental Energy. It will tell you all about strongfortism, show you how thousands of men who had lost their grip were able to become red-blooded, vigorous citizens again, and point out the way, the simple, easy, natural, quick way in which you can gain and retain health and strength and the ability to enjoy life. Send three two-cent stamps to cover postage and packing, and I will mail a copy to your address at once. Lionel Strongfort, Physical and Health Specialist, 809 Park Building, Newark, New Jersey. Free consultation coupon. Mr. Lionel Strongfort, Newark, New Jersey, please send me your book, Promotion and Conservation of Health, Strength, and Mental Energy, for postage of which I enclose three two-cent stamps. I have marked X before the subject in which I am interested. Colds, catarr, asthma, obesity, headache, thinness, rupture, lumbago, neuritis, neuralgia, flat chest, deformity, describe, insomnia, short wind, flat feet, stomach disorders, constipation, biliousness, torpid liver, indigestion, nervousness, poor memory, rheumatism, despondency, youthful errors, vital losses, impotency, gastritis, heart weakness, poor circulation, skin disorders, round shoulders, lung troubles, increased height, stoop shoulders, muscular development, name, age, occupation, street, city, state, write plainly. Lionel Strongfort, Dr. Sargent of Harvard declared that Strongfort is unquestionably the finest specimen of physical development ever seen. End of Advertisement for Strongfortism Printed in Electrical Experimenter, March 1919 Coffee Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Temperance by S. C. Ferguson and E. A. Allen There is beauty in temperance like that which is portrayed in virtue and in truth. It is a close ally of both, and, like them, has that all-pervading essence and quality which chastens the feelings, invigorates the mind, and displays the perfection of the soul, in the very aspect like water from the rill rain from the cloud or light from the heavenly bodies the thought issues pure from within refreshing unsullied and radiant there is no grossness no dross no corruption for temperance when effectually realized is full of loveliness and joy and virtue and purity are the lineaments in which it lives Temperance is a virtue without pride, and fortune without envy, the best guardian of youth and support of old age, the preceptor of reason as well as of religion, and physician of the soul as well as of the body, the tutelar goddess of health and universal medicine of life. Temperance keeps the senses clear and unembarrassed, and makes them seize the object with more keenness and satisfaction. It appears with life in the face and decorum in the person. 
it gives you the command of your head secures your health and preserves you in a condition for business temperance is a virtue which casts the truest lustre upon the person it is lodged in and has the most general influence upon all other particular virtues of any that the soul of man is capable of indeed so general is it that there is hardly any noble quality or endowment of the mind but must own temperance either for its parent or its nurse it is the greatest strengthener and clearer of reason and the best preparer of it for religion it is the sister of prudence and the handmaid of devotion pleasure has been aptly compared to the sea intemperance is a maelstrom situated in the very centre of this great sea not one path alone leads to this gulf of woe not one only current as too many have supposed hurries down this dark abyss but all around on every side the waters tend downward there are a thousand currents leading in some it is true are more rapid than others some rush in quickly and bear down all who ride upon their waters to quick and certain ruin others glide more slowly but none the less surely to the same end the streams of intemperance are legions the allurements that lead downward are equally numerous every appetite lust passion and feeling holds out various allurements to intemperate indulgence there is not a power of the mind affection of the heart nor desire of the body that may not dispose to some form of intemperance which may injure the physical being or paralyze the energies of the mind all forms of intemperance are evil and destroy some function of mind or body some member or faculty the disease of which spreads in harmony through the whole the dangers from this source are imminent and fearful and spread on every hand temperance conduces to health indeed it may be said that health can only be acquired or maintained by temperance this is the law primary and essential which every youth should know and know by heart bodily pains and aches tell of intemperance in some directions pain means penalty and penalty means that its sufferer should reform the most of our pains are occasioned by intemperance this is the fruitful mother of nine-tenths of the diseases that flesh is heir to and the sins that the soul doth commit we sin by excess of anger lust appetite affection love of gain authority or praise few if any are the sins that grow not out of intemperance in some form intemperance means excess a thing is good as long as it is necessary all beyond necessity or what is necessary is evil money is good more than what is necessary to the ends of life is evil food is good too much is evil light is good too much will put out our eyes water is good too much will destroy us heat is good too much will burn us the praise of men is good too much will ruin us the love of life is good too much will make us miserable fear is good too much hath torment prayer is good too much cheats labor of its life and is evil sympathy is good too much floods us with perpetual grief reason is good too much pressed with labor it dethrones the mind and spreads ruin abroad any excess in the use or activity of a good thing is intemperance and therefore evil and to be avoided temperance as a virtue dwells in the heart it consists in a rigid subjection of every inward feeling and power to the rule of right reason he who would be thoroughly temperate must master himself his passions must be his subjects obeying his will from the heart he must be temperate he must remember that the intemperate slope is an almost imperceptible one and that he may be gliding down it when he dreams of naught but safety he must remember too that the field of temperance is a broad one covering the whole area of life 
It is not simply against one form of appetite, one species of indulgence that he is to guard, but against all. There are other species of intemperate indulgence of which we are all more or less guilty than indulgence in drink. Indeed, the indulgence of appetite carries away more victims from the earth than does drunkenness, and spreads a wider devastation and a more general blight. All species of intemperance grow of a want of self-control. To be a temperance man, a man must master himself, must be brave, noble conqueror of every enemy within his own bosom. It is no small matter. It is the masterpiece of human attainments. The laws of temperance can never be broken with impunity. The excess is committed today, but the effect is experienced tomorrow. The law of nature, invariable in its operation, is that penalty shall follow excess. The punishment is mild at first, but afterwards more and more severe, until, when nature's warning voice has been unheeded and her punishments disregarded, the final penalty is death. If an admonitory signboard were hung out for the benefit of the young, there should be inscribed upon it, in prominent characters, no excess. It is to be remembered that the best principles, if pushed too far, degenerate into fatal vices. Generosity is nearly allied to extravagance. Charity itself may lead to ruin. The sternness of justice is but one step removed from the severity of oppression. If one would make the most of life, he must be temperate in all things. It is the application of reason to all the daily acts of life. It is the highest and best form of life that one can attain to. It leads not only to the greatest happiness, but also to honour and position. By abstaining from most things, it is surprising how many things we enjoy. To establish thoroughly and widely the principles of temperance, we must begin with the youth. They have a high aspiration to be good and true. They see a glory in the path of right. Freedom is a word of power in their ears. Virtue has many charms not only for their hearts, but for their imaginations. They have health, competency and happiness. They are ambitious of every good. When the true principles of temperance are established in early life and made the controlling power through life, they ensure health, freedom from pain, competency, respectability, honour, virtue, usefulness and happiness, all for which true men have or hope in this life. Happy would it be if they were general and all youths would practice them. Then would religion assert her mild and gentle way Peace plant her olive wreath in every nation. Wisdom, divine and time-honoured, shed everywhere her glorious light. A race of men and women, full of rosy health, strong, active, symmetrical, beautiful as the artist's model, pure, virtuous, wise, affectionate, full of honour and lofty principles, would grow up in communities and nations, and make the earth bloom and rejoice in more than Eden gladness. A new heaven and a new earth would surround us with beauty, and arch over us with glory, for the old would have passed away. End of Temperance Coffee Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp. A victim to 107 fatal maladies from Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. I remember going to the British Museum one day to read up the treatment for some slight ailment of which I had a touch. Hay fever, I fancy it was. I got down the book and read all I came to read, and then in an unthinking moment I idly turned the leaves and began to indolently study diseases generally. I forgot which was the first distemper I plunged into, some fearful devastating scourge, I know, 
and before I had glanced half down the list of premonitory symptoms, it was borne in upon me that I had fairly got it. I sat for a while, frozen with horror. And then, in the listlessness of despair, I again turned over the pages. I came to typhoid fever, read the symptoms, discovered that I had typhoid fever, must have had it for months without knowing it, wondered what else I had got, turned up St. Vitus's dance, found, as I expected, that I had that too, began to get interested in my case, and determined to sift it to the bottom, and so started alphabetically, read up ague, and learned that I was sickening for it, and that the acute stage would commence in about another fortnight. Bright's disease, I was relieved to find, I had only in a modified form, and so far as that was concerned, I might live for years. Cholera I had with severe complications, and diphtheria I seemed to have been born with. I plotted conscientiously through the twenty-six letters, and the only malady I could conclude I had not got was housemaid's knee. I felt rather hurt about this at first. It seemed somehow to be a sort of slight. Why hadn't I got housemaid's knee? Why this invidious reservation? After a while, however, less grasping feelings prevailed. I reflected that I had every other known malady in the pharmacology, and I grew less selfish and determined to do without housemaid's knee. Gout, in its most malignant stage, it would appear had seized me without my being aware of it, and zymosis I had evidently been suffering with from boyhood. There were no more diseases after zymosis, so I concluded there was nothing else the matter with me. I sat and pondered. I thought, what an interesting case I must be from a medical point of view. What an acquisition I would be to a class. Students would have no need to walk the hospitals if they had me. I was a hospital in myself. All they would need to do would be to walk round me and, after that, take their diploma. Then I wondered how long I had to live. I tried to examine myself. I felt my pulse. I could not at first feel any pulse at all. Then all of a sudden it seemed to start off. I pulled out my watch and timed it. I made it 147 to the minute. I tried to feel my heart. I could not feel my heart. It had stopped beating. I have since been induced to come to the opinion that it must have been there all the time, and must have been beating, but I cannot account for it. I patted myself all over my front, from what I call my waist up to my head, and I went a bit round each side and a little way up the back, but I could not feel or hear anything. I tried to look at my tongue. I stuck it out as far as ever it would go, and shut one eye and tried to examine it with the other. I could only see the tip, and the only thing that I could gain from that was to feel more certain before that I had scarlet fever. I had walked into that reading room a happy, healthy man. I crawled out a decrepit wreck. I went to my medical man. He is an old chum of mine and feels my pulse and looks at my tongue and talks about the weather all for nothing when I fancy I'm ill, so I thought I would do him a good turn by going to him now. What a doctor wants, I said, is practice. He shall have me. He will get more practice out of me than out of 1,700 of your ordinary commonplace patients with only one or two diseases each. So I went straight up and saw him, and he said, Well, what's the matter with you? I said, I will not take up your time, dear boy, with telling you what is the matter with me. Life is brief, and you might pass away before I had finished. But I will tell you what is not the matter with me. I have not got housemaid's knee. Why I have not got housemaid's knee, I cannot tell you. But the fact remains that I have not got it. Everything else, however, I have got. And I told him how I came to discover it all. Then he opened me and looked down me and clutched hold of my wrist, and then he hit me over the chest when I wasn't expecting it, a cowardly thing to do, I call it, and immediately afterwards butted me with the side of his head. After that he sat down and wrote out a prescription, and folded it up and gave it me, and I put it in my pocket and went out. I did not open it. I took it to the nearest chemist's and handed it in. The man read it and then handed it back. He said he didn't keep it. I said, You are a chemist. He said, I am a chemist. If I was a cooperative stores and family hotel combined, 
I might be able to oblige you. Being only a chemist hampers me. I read the prescription. It ran, One pound beefsteak with one pint bitter beer every six hours. One ten-mile walk every morning. One bed at eleven sharp every night. And don't stuff up your head with things you don't understand. I followed the directions, with the happy result, speaking for myself, that my life was preserved and is still going on. End of A Victim to 107 Fatal Maladies Coffee Break Collection 17 Health and Fitness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. What a Young Woman Ought to Know Exercise by Dr. Mary Wood Allen You said to me, my daughter, that you wanted to join the class in physical culture. I asked you why, and you said, because you thought you needed to build up in certain parts of the body. You were defective in muscular development. You needed also to acquire grace, you thought. And I said, is muscular development the primary object of physical education? You seem to think that it is. Now I want to talk to you a little along that line and to demonstrate to you, if I can, that physical education is not primarily for the building up of big muscle or for the gaining of power to do great feats of bodily strength or skill. The object of physical education is to develop a quickly responsive, flexible instrument for the soul to use, for that is what the body is. Physical culture, rightly conducted, aims to secure the highest condition of the body through the exercises that are required by the laws of the body. Law, physical law, governs the body, and exercise should be according to this law. The first object of exercise is to make a vital supply for the whole body. This is first secured by proper attitude. If we stand or sit properly, we gain a proper position of the vital organs, and then they will do their work well, and the result will be more perfect nutrition. The use of certain organs increases supply, and the use of others quickens waste. A balance should be maintained between the two. We must nourish the life-sustaining organs before using the organs which use up brain supply. Therefore, we want to be sure that we are working according to these laws. A great many people have an idea that physical culture means building up big muscle. They measure the muscles of the arm and of the leg, and judge by their increase in size of the value of the exercise. This is not a correct measurement. Individuals may weigh themselves down by development of muscles until they have not sufficient internal vital force to carry so much weight. If we could only balance between the organs which supply nutriment and the organs which use it up, we would keep in perfect health. We want to learn how to secure a maximum of results with a minimum of force. That is, we want the body to be quickly responsive, to be flexible, to be so that we can use it for the things we want to do without wasting strength, and yet without being weighed down by a superabundance of muscular tissue. The first desideratum in taking exercise is to have every organ of the body free. Therefore, a gymnastic dress is a necessity. Then we should have the exercise conducted by someone who understands the peculiarities of each individual and knows just what exercises are suited for her in her special physical condition. They should also be directed by one who understands perfectly that the girl with an anemic brain that is, with the brain having too little blood, cannot be conducted on the same plan as the exercise of the girl who has a superabundance of blood in her brain. The best exercise is that which employs the mind pleasantly. A good deal of exercise may be obtained in housework, and, if conducted with pleasure in the work, may be of great physical advantage. Not long ago I listened to a very charming talk by a lady whose dress betokened her a woman of society. She wore white kid gloves, a dainty flower bonnet, and in herself appeared an exponent of leisure and happiness. Her address was entitled The Home Gymnasium, 
and I supposed that it would consist of descriptions of machinery that could be put up in one's own dwelling for gymnastic purposes, but I soon found that her home gymnasium meant household duties. She said one could scrub the table and obtain the best exercise for arms and chest, and at the same time produce an article or piece of furniture which would be a delight to the eye in its whiteness and brightness. She said that in scrubbing the floor, one obtained very much the same movement that would be given in the gymnasium, while at the same time the exercise would conduce not only to the personal advantage, but to the happiness of the family. She spoke of sweeping and dusting and bed-making, and expressed herself as competent to do all these kinds of work, in fact, as doing them, and she said she never felt more of a lady than when scrubbing her kitchen floor, and she was not ashamed to be seen by her friends at this work. If any one rang the doorbell, she said she would simply put on a clean apron and go to the door and remark without hesitation that she was just scrubbing her kitchen floor, but she was glad to see her friends. This sort of a home gymnasium is at the command of nearly every girl, and if she can bring herself to feel an interest in this home gymnastic exercise, she may find it conducive not only to her own physical well-being, but to the comfort and happiness of all about her. The question is often asked whether bicycle riding is injurious for girls, and I would say that in my opinion it depends largely upon the girl. Has she good common sense? Of course I am speaking of the girl who is in a normal condition of health. A girl of extreme delicacy, or who is subject to some functional difficulty, or the victim of some organic disease, might not find it advantageous to ride. A physician should, in these cases, be consulted. But for the ordinary girl, the girl of fairly good health, if she will learn how to sit properly upon her saddle, will have the good sense to ride with judgment, it seems to me that the exercise must be productive of great good. My own experience is somewhat limited. I made some discoveries in my attempts to ride. In the first place, I learned that it was important to know how to sit. In reading a book on Physical Culture and Hygiene for Women by Dr. Anna Galbraith, I found this sentence, Sit upon the gluteal muscles and not upon the perineum. This was a revelation to me. I found that I had been doing the thing which was not proper, and bearing the weight almost entirely upon the perineum had caused constant rectal irritation. The gluteal muscles, closely held together, form a firm support for the body without injuring any of the vital organs. I found that by distributing the weight a little upon the handlebars and some upon the feet, I was able to sit with less weight and heaviness upon the saddle. I found, too, that it was quite important to have the saddle high enough so that the legs might be fully extended at each stroke, and with these precautions I found the wheel a source both of enjoyment and of strength. The harm done by the wheel I believe in most instances to be due to an ill-adapted saddle or a lack of good judgment in the amount of exercise taken. It is such a fascinating exercise one seems to be flying and scarcely realizes how much of nerve force is being expended. If the girl learning to ride will be prudent, gauging the amount of exercise by her amount of strength, if she will gradually acquire the needed strength before attempting long wheeling trips, if she will be judicious and not ride, perhaps, during the first two or three days of menstruation, there seems to be no reason why the ordinary girl should not be entirely benefited by this most delightful form of exercise. It is not as objectionable to any degree as to the exercise of dancing. Dancing is a most fascinating amusement, and if it only could be conducted under proper circumstances, it would be very delightful. In itself, it is not so objectionable as in its concomitants, the late hours, the improper dressing, the hearty suppers in the middle of the night, the promiscuous association, and the undue familiarity of the attitude of the round dance are what make dancing objectionable. If dancing could be conducted out of doors, in the daylight, with intimate friends, without the round dances, only those forms of dancing which may be likened to gymnastics, as the contra dance, the cotillion, the objections to dancing would be largely removed. But I am of the opinion that a large share of the fascination of dancing 
would go at the same time skating is a delightful invigorating form of exercise if conducted with judgment one objection to it is that the girl will skate until wearied and then in that exhausted condition perhaps ride home or take a long tiresome walk from the pond to her residence all of which is sapping her unduly and annulling the value of the skating as an exercise lawn tennis is delightful and beneficial provided it is undertaken with due judgment and the girl is properly dressed in fact the subject of dress is so closely associated with that of exercise that they can never be considered separately even the moderate exercise of walking conducted in the dress of the fashionable woman is in itself an element of danger whereas more violent exercise in a loose dress becomes a means of increased strength and vigor i am often asked if girls should be allowed to run up and down stairs i see no reason why girls should not go up and down stairs just as freely as boys if they are properly dressed but going up and down stairs in tight clothing is certainly very injurious end of what a young woman ought to know exercise by dr mary wood allen coffee break collection 17 health and fitness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org why do you use exercise by david hume 1711 to 1776 from essays and treatises number five it appears evident that the ultimate ends of human actions can never in any case be accounted for by reason but recommend themselves entirely to the sentiments and affections of mankind without any dependence on the intellectual faculties ask a man why he uses exercise he will answer because he desires to keep his health if you then inquire why he desires health he will readily reply because sickness is painful if you push your inquiries farther and desire a reason why he hates pain it is impossible he can ever give any this is an ultimate end and is never referred to any other object perhaps to your second question why he desires health he may also reply that it is necessary for the exercise of his calling if you ask why he is anxious on that head he will answer because he desires to get money if you demand why it is the instrument of pleasure says he and beyond this it is an absurdity to ask for a reason it is impossible there can be a progress in infinitum and that one thing can always be a reason why another is desired something must be desirable on its own account and because of its immediate accord or agreement with human sentiment and affection now as virtue is an end and is desirable on its own account without fee or reward merely for the immediate satisfaction which it conveys it is requisite that there should be some sentiment which it touches some internal taste or feeling or whatever you please to call it which distinguishes moral good and evil and which embraces the one and rejects the other thus the distinct boundaries and offices of reason and of taste are easily ascertained the former conveys the knowledge of truth and falsehood the latter gives the sentiment of beauty and deformity vice and virtue the one discovers objects as they really stand in nature without addition or diminution the other has a productive faculty and gilding or staining all natural objects with the colors borrowed from internal sentiment raises in a manner a new creation reason being cool and disengaged is no motive to action and directs only the impulse received from appetite and inclination by showing us the means of attaining happiness or avoiding misery taste as it gives pleasure or pain and thereby constitutes happiness or misery becomes a motive to action 
and is the first spring or impulse to desire and volition from circumstances and relations known or supposed the former leads us to the discovery of the concealed and unknown after all circumstances and relations are laid before us the latter makes us feel from the whole a new sentiment of blame or approbation the standard of the one being founded on the nature of things is eternal and inflexible even by the will of the supreme being the standard of the other rising from the internal frame and constitution of animals is ultimately derived from that supreme will which bestowed on each being its peculiar nature and arranged the several classes and orders of existence End of Why Do You Use Exercise by David Hume <laughs>